This report brought to you by the Richmond Club, where investors and high growth companies meet. Our first presenter today is Dan Blondell. He is the CEO of Nano One Materials. Great. Um, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, thanks for being here, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. So, my name is Dan Blondell. I am the CEO of Nano One Materials. We are uh, listed on the Venture Exchange here in Toronto, uh, also with a, a NASDAQ international platform listing in, uh, in the States. Um, and uh, we are based in Vancouver, Canada, and that's where our pilot facility, laboratory, and, uh, and our headquarters are, are located. Um, very, in a very sort of high level of view, we are working in the lithium ion battery space. We are developing technology to make the cathode materials that go into lithium ion batteries. So that the cathode material is, a, uh, is the stuff that actually holds lithium ions as you charge and discharge the battery. It's a powder that goes into the battery and forms one of the electrodes. The, uh, the applications for these types of materials are range anywhere from electric buses to electric vehicles, to grid storage, to consumer electronics, basically any lithium ion battery application, we are able to address that part of the market. The total market for cathode materials, that black powder that goes into the battery, is projected to be about $23 billion in 2025. And we have a world-class process for making these materials. Uh, it's proven, it's piloted, it's patented, and we have a pipeline of strategic interest in the company that's grown from about one company this time last year to 20 that we have right now and we've taken two of those uh, over the last six months uh, working with them and converted them into uh, actual agreements Pu Lead Technologies and Saint Gobain I'll speak to them in more detail a little bit later but I wanted to give you a quick uh, sense of where we've taken the company and we do expect to bring more agreements, more uh, joint development agreements, possibly sight lines towards revenue uh, and access to some of these marketplaces uh, in the coming year. Um, the lithium ion battery material within the, within the, the battery itself, uh, the cathode material comprises about a quarter of the cost of the cell. There's other things like graphite and copper foil and aluminum foil and various other uh, components in there, but the cathode is really the major component. The raw materials that go into the cathode comprise the largest component of that. And there are different types of lithium ion batteries, lithium being the, uh, the consistent component um, uh, with different chemistry. So sometimes it's lithium and cobalt, that's what's in your phone. Sometimes it's lithium, cobalt, nickel and manganese, that's what's going into electric cars. Uh, electric buses and grid storage mechanisms are lithium, iron, and phosphate. So really they're all these different formulas. I'm not going to get into a lot of the detail in this presentation, just trying to give you a quick overview. But we take those raw materials, we, we, we develop a chemical process that actually combines them in, an, in, uh, in a, in a water-based process and, and forms the composite structures that allow lithium ions to circulate in and out during the charge and discharge of the battery. We have 11 patents granted, and those patents are in the US, they're in Canada, they're in Taiwan, Japan, Korea, and China. And uh, we have patents being uh, prosecuted and possibly uh, to be issued in Europe, as well as those other jurisdictions. About 30 of them are pending. Our goal is to reduce the cost of the of the raw of these materials that go into the cathode. So that's uh, accessing lower cost raw materials, eliminating waste streams, and by providing larger scale manufacturing to drive down costs. Ultimately, uh, we are also trying to boost performance. That's improving the capacity of the battery, the charging, how quickly you can charge and discharge the battery, and the cycling. That basically has to do with the calendar life. How long does the battery last? The um, uh, the different types of cathode materials um, that you see here, I'm not going to go through these acronyms, they consist of the, of the raw materials I looked at before. They all have different properties and serve different parts of the market uh, and of course are used by uh, these recognizable brands in various applications that range from consumer electronics to grid storage. To, uh, to the whole electric vehicle space. It's projected to be about $23 billion, as I said in a previous slide, in the 2025 timeframe. That will largely be driven by, about 75% of that market will be driven by the electric vehicle space. And that includes buses, that includes, uh, uh, that includes 
um, industrial vehicles, fleet vehicles, and of course electric vehicles as well. Um, what we uh, what we see in the sort of the Tesla market and VW and various other uh, folks. The uh, our technology is a flexible platform for making these materials. We can make all of the above, although we do tend to concentrate on the ones that we feel are have the most growth potential and are the most critically. Uh, are most critical to the to the expansion of the market. Our platform also enables us to innovate uh, in materials and we continue to bring innovations and more patents to the table with the idea of broadening that market space and making uh, bringing costs down and making better performance. Nano One is pursuing a licensing strategy, possibly joint venture, and we'll speak to that in a little bit more detail. The basis for the deal that we put together with Pu Lead in China is based on a licensing strategy. Ultimately, if we look at the whole cathode market, we won't get the whole cathode market, but we look at the whole one uh, and we assume up to a 5% royalty, the total market opportunity for Nano One is kind of in the billion dollar a year range. Uh, that assumes we get 100% of the market, which of course we won't, but that is what, uh, what the size of the market is for us. Um, very uh, quickly, I'm going to walk you through the supply chain. We looked very briefly before at the lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt materials that go in. Those are the typical input materials. We process them in an aqueous reactor, mild temperature, atmospheric pressure. We cook things in a furnace. Because of the way we mix things in the reactor, we can cut that furnace time down from industry, uh, where, where industry is, is firing in, in terms of days, we're firing in terms of hours. So there's efficiencies there. We make a better structured material, which improves the performance. And uh, that is really where our wheelhouse is, 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 is assembling those raw materials into a value added material that goes into a battery. Those cathodes will go into conventional lithium ion batteries and next generation solid state batteries and of course the applications range across the board from consumer electronics to vehicles all the way to, to the grid storage and renewable storage space. Uh, the, the two partners I spoke about before, Saint Gobain and Poulid, we announced those in December and January of this year, so very, very new. We brought them across the line, it took us about six months from the time we started working with them to convert them into actual leads and we are working across the supply chain here uh, with a whole number of recognizable names and also some uh, some of the players upstream in the in the lithium cobalt nickel space the cathode arena the battery cell manufacturers and of course the OEMs uh, most of those names you'll be familiar with the pilot plant we built looks like this. It's based in, in uh, Burnaby, BC, just outside of Vancouver. You're looking at the reactor where, the, where most of the magic happens. This is where we assemble the lithium and the nickel and the manganese to produce the cathode material. And then eventually it gets cooked in a furnace, which is just a kiln that, that makes it into a ceramic powdered material. Um, that's done in the range of about seven to 900 degrees Celsius. Uh, and as I said, we've managed to patent a good lot of this process as well as the materials that come out of the process as well. We are currently working with about uh, 18 to 20 uh, players in the space that includes tier one automotives out of Europe and out of Asia, and, and as well as the, uh, the players I mentioned in the previous slides. The pilot allows us to simulate and de-risk production it allows us to work with a variety of different types of cathode materials for different applications. Uh, we have many interests. Poulid and Saint Gobain have come online as uh, as active partners, and uh, this pilot allows us to develop engineering models and capex and pot and, and opex uh, models, which we've gone out and presented to these players for the uh, for the concept of of, of uh, scaling up to commercial production. Very quick summary of who Pu Lead is. They are uh, a very large Chinese cathode producer. They have locations uh, all over China. They have seen approximately kind of 30% growth uh, year over year over the last three to four years. And uh, with a dominant, um, dominant in, a, in a variety of different materials. Lithium cobalt oxide is the material that's in your phone. And they currently supply that uh, lithium cobalt oxide to ATL who actually supply uh, supply Apple. So the, basically anyone with an Apple phone here today has got Poo Leeds cathode materials in it. So a very reputable player. They also supply about 15% of the market in lithium iron phosphate, and that's what the agreement we have in place with them is. Lithium iron phosphate is used in electric buses. 
uh, there's going to be by 2025, I think there's going supposed to be just shy of uh, of a million electric buses um, populated around the world, of which we'll see a lithium-ion battery being circulated in and out of that bus every eight years. So there's going to be a very large um, flow of lithium-ion batteries based on on lithium iron phosphate, we're also going to see that technology being adopted for the storage of energy from renewables. The uh, net, uh, pool lead came to us because they have very large scale up plans uh, in, uh, in over the next five years and they're looking for a technology partner to help give them a competitive advantage in the manufacturing space and we have technology that drives down the cost. They have probably 20 customers worldwide including ATL, BAIC, uh, BYD, who are the largest electric vehicle manufacturer in China, and they have a proven respectful licensing program with uh, licenses drawn for uh, from Preon, BASF, and Umicore, who are uh, who are very prominent players in the cathode material space. So uh, we are we're very excited to be working with them. A brief look at what the economics look like in LFP. Uh, today, lithium and iron and phosphate comprise about 75% of the cost of making LFP. And they, the way it's done in industry today uh, is either in a hydrothermal process, which is like a big pressure cooker. Um, that's the most expensive way to do it. Solid state process is used primarily in China. That's less expensive. And then what we do, uh, we drive down the, uh, the cost of iron and phosphate and allows us to expand margins. In China, that could be 10 to 15 percent. Outside of China, we could see margin increases closer to 40 percent. Um, that, when we look at the total market uh, of, of LFP, it's about 200,000 tons in 2025. That's doubling from where it is today. And uh, that could be anywhere, for us, anywhere from a 60 to 100 million dollar royalty to Nano One. Um, that wouldn't involve a lot of CapEx expansion on our part. Uh, of course, as a, as a licensing deal, the margins are quite high. Um, I'm going to step uh, through very quickly our last partner here, St. Gobain. They are a 400-year-old ceramics company. They got, their, uh, they got their play in glass and mirrors uh, probably 400 years ago. $45 billion, 45 billion euro company and we are working on them with the co-developing the thermal processing, the, the, the part where the, the materials go into the furnace get converted into a ceramic material. Our revenue model has us projected right now uh, based on partly on the, on the deal with Poo Lead and partly on other emerging deals that we're working on, has us projected to be kind of in the $60 million range in 2025. And we have near term, we have near term goals with lithium iron phosphate, also with cathode materials based on nickel, manganese, cobalt. And uh, I'm going to step through this very quickly just to keep it short. There are a variety of different benefits of these materials. I think primarily LFP is low cost and it has applications in short range electric vehicles and any industrial applications. The midterm uh, 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 focus that we have is in a very high energy density materials that have certainly many challenges. They're costly materials but they have applications in uh, any high energy density, long range electric vehicles. And then lastly, a uh, next generation material which removes cobalt enti entirely and uh, is, is, uh, is relatively easy to handle. We're going to see applications of that across the board in consumer electronics all the way through to the energy storage market. We have $3.1 million in the bank. We have about $4 million in warrants and options um, uh, that are all in the money. We expect those to come in the next year. We're burning about $300,000 a year. You know, insiders own 13%. Key shareholders include people like Keith Newmeyer, Ross Beatty, US Global out of the, out of the states. Um, so we have a very prominent shareholder base. Um, uh, sorry, I, I briefly went over some of our, our key people here. Paul Matisic is our, the chairman of the company, and he has led somewhere between two and three billion dollars of enterprise growth over the last eight years uh, of his career. And uh, very uh, quickly, we've raised approximately fourteen and a half million dollars in the in the markets. We've also added to that five million dollars in non-dilutive government grants, and we are uh, back at the trough with them again to try and bring more non-dilutive monies into the company. And uh, shares outstanding, 66 million outstanding right now, and we have runway through 2020. Uh, and that is uh, basically the, the summary. If you've enjoyed this video, please let us know. You've been watching the Richmond Club Report. If you've just come across this channel, please feel free to subscribe. 
I'm sure you'll find a lot of interesting and profitable investment ideas around here. We'll see you again soon on the next video. Cheers, guys. Have an amazing and profitable day.